I do, but uh, and, and to to see how this fits together, and especially to begin our talk about the new community, we want to uh, we don't want to belabor the point, but we do want to go back to the beginning because in the beginning, what kind of relationship did God have? did humankind have, man and woman have with God? What kind of relationship did we have in the beginning with God? Face to face, intimate, one on one. What kind of relationship did we have with one another? In that, It was only a community of two, but what kind of relationship did they have? What's that? Oh, sorry, I thought. They had a wonderful relationship. There's nothing, there's nothing between them. Um, I think there's a phrase in the Bible that captures it. They were naked and they were not ashamed. Adam and Eve have nothing to hide. There's, there's no pretense, there is no hypocrisy, there is no sin. There is nothing that separates them from one another. Can you imagine living in a world where there is nothing that separates anyone from one another or from God? We don't live in that world, do we? We don't live in that world today. We haven't lived in that world since Genesis 3. But that was the nature of the world. And the entrance of sin into the world, as we've noted, uh, destroys all of that. It certainly destroys and severs the relationship between man and woman and, and the Lord, as we find them hiding and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, that entrance of sin into the world, when they doubt God, when they doubt the goodness of God, when they're deceived by the serpent, and they take what was forbidden them, their eyes are open. But their eyes are not opened in the way that they thought they were going to be. Their eyes are open to their complete estrangement from the Creator. Uh, that is the fall. That is where it occurs. And that, that self-centeredness, that pride, that sinfulness, now spurred on by all kinds of evil desires that seem to be awakened, begins to wreak havoc in the relationships between human beings. We see it immediately with Adam and Eve. How many times have we heard that story? The finger pointing, the blaming. Immediately, this beautiful relationship is gone uh, because of sin. And, uh, and as... Uh, as they're pointing the fingers, you know, pointing at one another and blaming one another, God says something to Eve in Genesis 3.16. And though it is a pronouncement of a curse, I think in a sense God is all, only saying what's already happened. Remember he says, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And we spent some time on that phrase months ago, and we're not going to do that today. Whatever you make of that phrase, this much is sure. <laughs> this much is sure about that phrase. There will now forever be rivalry. There will be rivalry between people. There will be rivalry between the only two people on the face of the earth. She will have certain desires. Her husband will have a tendency to dominate. There's going to be this, there's going to be a, a, a pulling. There's going to be, there's going to be tension here. And of course, this doesn't just stay with them. This isn't just about what's going to happen to them. This is what happens to everybody. What's the next sign in the Bible that people are not going to get along? In the Bible, and just in the story there in, back in Genesis, taking off from Adam and Eve, what's the next thing that shows us things aren't going well in the world? King kills his brother Abel. Bro, two brothers. He kills his brother. And we're told why. It's out of that sense of rivalry, that, that sense of competition, that sense of... Uh, you know, he's accepted, I'm not, or, or whatever, you know, whatever is going on uh, with Cain and Abel, uh, we see that. This is what's going on in, in kind of this, this aftermath of the fall that we talked about at length in Genesis 4 through 11. And then we see, when we read carefully in these chapters, remember Cain's descendants. We read through the lineage of Cain after he goes off on his way, not a single mention of God. Cain's descendants turn away from God. And by the time you get down to the 10th generation of Cain, uh, his, name, his name is Lamech, which happens to be, I think, the ninth of the, I mean, there's a Lamech in the other genealogy going down to Noah, but this is the Lamech coming down from Cain. Do you remember what this guy says? Hey, they may have, you know, it's like, if a man, if a man 
bug, bugs me, I'm putting him in the ground. I'm going to kill him. If, if it was Cain gets seven times vengeance, I get 70 times seven or 77 times vengeance. Cain's descendants, have, uh, the picture that we got have just in that genealogy is things have fallen apart in that line of humanity. And if Genesis 6, if we're to understand, as, I mean, as I understand it, the sons of God and the daughters of men intermarrying, I believe is a reference, I won't make the case again, we did that again months ago, a reference to the descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain. And those that have been righteous with the Lord and those that have been unrighteous intermarry. And what results in Genesis chapter 6 is that the thought of man's heart is only evil continually. That's where the world goes in Genesis 6. And the flood. <laughs> the flood comes and God destroys all of that. Uh, and after the deluge, we come to the tower. And in the tower, we have what men, first of all, standing up against God. But then, you know, as, as God will confuse their languages and send them dividing into groups of people. Those groups of people become peoples and nations. And historically, what do all those nations eventually do? They fight. Are we not fighting today? Are nations not fighting nations today? It's what happens. This, this starts in Genesis chapter 3, and everything that follows, uh, it just, you know, in Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis 1 through 11 is such an important portion of Scripture for a lot of reasons, but one thing it does, you get to the end of Genesis 11, it's like, is there any hope for this world? Because it just doesn't look like and it doesn't matter what happens, it just goes from bad to worse. And then God does something. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It is a turning point in Scripture. It's the call of Abraham. The call of Abraham. This, this is what God does. And in that very moment, he begins to address everything that's just happened. It will be 2,000 years as he works from Abraham down to get to Jesus, but the plan has started. And we go back to Abraham and we see God creating this family out of Abraham. We see him bringing Isaac, the son of promise, not the son of Hagar, the son of Sarah, the son of promise in the old age. Isaac, that's where the family will come. Then Isaac has a couple of boys and the family's not gonna be through both of them, but only through one, through Jacob whose name will be changed to Israel. He's got the 12 sons. We get now the 12 tribes, the, the 12 uh, clans, and then eventually the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel, the King David of Israel from the tribe of Judah. And we look back on that and we see, okay, God, the genius, the majesty, the awesome power of God. I, this is what, to me, one of the things that the way we're looking at scripture, it brings us up over and over again. All of this pushback, all, all that is the creation is headed for, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, that's the moment where God reveals what he's going to do. Now, we, we're in possession of the end game. Uh, they weren't until post-Christ. We see where this is headed, and but God was beginning to work right there. And what was Israel to be? A light to the nations. What does that mean to you, that Israel, what, what was God's plan? Because you see, in Abraham and in his family, God's creating a community. He's create. wow, <laughs> let there be light. One more, one more. Keep it up, keep it up. Uh, sorry, I, totally, I got all excited about that. I forgot my, my train of thought here. But um, what, what does it mean, uh, as, as God calls this new community through Abraham and his family into existence, what does it mean uh, to be a light to the Gentiles? What's God's plan for them? What does, that, what does that entail? What is God wanting to happen through Israel? Inclusion. Inclusion. Exactly. To bring all the nations together. To bring all the nations. God pr makes provision for the nations to come to the temple. Uh, everybody is there's a house it's a house of prayer for all nations God wants Israel to be his priest to the world 
to bring the world to him, to bring about the creation of this new community. How do they do? Give them a grade. <laughs> okay, they get an F. There, there are a few folks along the way who get this and who make some valiant efforts. And, and let's be fair, well, yeah, we'll be fair. Uh, by the time we get to the New Testament, we do have um, we do have some Gentile proselytes coming in, and, and there are people who are interested in Yahweh from outside of Israel. But even so, in the Gospels, how does it appear that the Jews and Gentiles see one another, even in, even in, even in the best of life? How do the Pharisees feel about the Gentiles? They're inferior. They're, they don't belong. They're outsiders. They're unclean. They've got no place here. Yeah, the wall around the, the, the temple. Gentile, you've got nobody to blame but yourself for your death if you come through that gate. <laughs> yeah, that's the house of prayer for all nations. And so, yeah, we, we, see, we see, of course, we see uh, some, uh, we see pushback in Jesus in, in the gospel. Uh, Reaching, I mean, Jesus with women, Jesus with Gentiles, Jesus with the outsiders. We see that the hints here, but uh, <clears throat> but there's an estrangement between people, <clears throat> and it's only Jesus who's going to be able to turn that thing around. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's just depressing, but what evidence of estrangement or brokenness do you see in the world today? I'm, I'm, we're going to limit our discussion, <laughs> I promise you, to just a, just a couple of moments. But, and you don't have, I mean, even if you're speaking in broad terms, where do you see estrangement, dysfunction, hatred, strife, um, people pulling apart rather than together? Uh, I, I, there's a thousand answers to this question, but just give a, let's just give a couple for the sake of illustration. More urban areas, city areas as opposed to country-wide outspaces or less condensed, so there's more pressure. Okay, uh, Donna points out that oftentimes in urban areas you have a lot more of, of pressure and strife because of the way people are packed in together. There's a lot of things about urban areas and anonymity that happens in the city that uh, you, that doesn't apply when you live in a, in a smaller area. How do you see, uh, yeah, Carlos. Families. Families. Divorce. Broken families. That, that's that's the, 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 what happened there. What happens there? And, we, and all of us have been affected by this. We've all been affected. Every single one of us here has been affected by, by problems in families of one nature or another. And it, it's the presence of sin in our families. And we see it. It's very real. And it's, it impacts our lives. But you guys are going for the, I mean, I was going for the easy stuff like Russia and Ukraine, like, you know, or, you know, or, you know, I mean, just, I mean, the warfare that's going on in the world. But it gets down to, and I think that's the way that this estrangement and anger and strife is. We see it on the big scale. We see it on the national scale. We see it in the way that people in our own country are divided. We're divided. I know I haven't been around all that long. Uh, to some of you, it may seem like a long time. But it, it, I, 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 I'm amazed at how much more divided the country is than it was 30 years ago. I remember Republicans and Democrats being friends and doing things together. And I remember people like Trent Lott and Daschle who couldn't have been further apart politically, picking up the phone and talking to each other and trying to find common ground for legislation for the country. I mean, how did Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan become friends? Not today. I mean, if you, if you don't know who Tip O'Neill, I mean, that's, that's maybe dating myself, but these people were, they were friendly to each other. Their disagreements politically were quite strong, but today it's name calling, it's demonizing, it's people aren't just, people don't just have a different idea. People who have a different idea are somehow just inherently evil and terrible, and they're demonized, and I mean, that's all over that's over our country, and God forbid that that kind of thinking ever, you know, come into the church. That's that's not how we're defined. But, 
but then it comes down to a, it comes down to, to just on a very personal level, and so, um, and you know, and we it's not and this whole political thing it's not about just the United States. If you watch the news, talk to talk to Renato and Jane about the division in Brazil, and it's just exactly along the same fault lines as as the United States. I'm not picking a side here. I'm just saying it's along the same fault lines, and uh, very very similar situations. Uh, the West Bank, Palestinians, Israelis, horrible. We get the point. Let's leave that behind. Let me flip the page. <laughs> People don't trust each other. There's rivalry. There's arrogance. There's pride. There's anger. There's violence. We haven't even gone down the pathway of, of things, for example, that have really made an impact in, in our country about racism and so forth, economic divides in our country. Uh, here's the good news, that through Jesus Christ, Jesus begins immediately to push back against this, this estrangement between people by bringing about the creation of a new community. Jesus creates a new community. He creates a new, pe a new people that are drawn out of all of that into a community that is created by the good news of Christ and that is shaped and sanctified and molded by the working of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people. I mentioned a minute ago, you see the beginnings of this in his ministry. Yes, he did go to the lost the sheep of the house of Israel, but but and that needed to be established because that's that's where the ministry of Christ begins. But we see this reaching out to the Samaritans. We see him going over to the Decapolis and feeding four thousand, you know, maybe Gentiles. We we see Jesus traveling into places that were outside of Israel, uh, as long as they might understand who he was coming as the as as the Messiah. But all of this comes to a a point of change. And how many times have we come back to the day of Pentecost? Uh, we're not going to, we're going to forego a lot of the details of the day of Pentecost that we've kind of laid out meticulously. We've gone through the sermon. Uh, we've gone through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're not, we're, we don't relive that. We're going to kind of move in a different way. But the long-awaited promise of the Holy Spirit is poured out. The apostles are first to benefit from that, but then in Peter's preaching, he makes clear that it's the, this promise of the Holy Spirit is for all who call upon the name of the Lord, who will experience those same blessings. These are the blessings of the new age. And what happens when people respond to the gospel? In the famous verse that we've all memorized, they receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The forgiveness of sins. This we, we talked about just a moment ago is a prerequisite for the creation of a new community. We've got to have our sins forgiven by the grace of God that we might now understand how by that same grace we can forgive one another and we can reconcile to one another. That, that's key to forgiving others, to living in harmony with others, the forgiveness of our own sins that allows us to be reconciled to God, that allows others to be reconciled to God, that we now can come into a community that is dominated by grace and a spirit of forgiveness and a desire for community. Then we also not only receive the forgiveness of our sins, but the gift of the Holy Spirit. And is it not through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that that character is shaped within us that allows for us to live together in peace, to accept one another, to love one another, to forgive one another, to be shaped in the image of Christ, to overcome, to have the spiritual power to overcome those, those deeds of the flesh and those lusts that's, that not only separate us from God, but divide us from one another. And so it, it's, it's, it's the forgiveness of sins and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that makes the formation of a new community possible. And we see it immediately. You think about this. From Acts 2.38, we're told what, what is now available through Jesus Christ, forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. What happens next? What happens immediately is the formation of a new community. 
Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. This is the start. This is where it all begins. And you've heard this, this little paragraph often. <clears throat> and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. There's a, there's a community. In Acts 2.42, there is now a community that never existed before. Well, they're all there. They're, all, they're, <clears throat> they're Jews there on, on the day of Pentecost. They, they have been connected there. <clears throat> And though we do know there are some proselytes, no doubt, in this number that have come together. <clears throat> if we go back to this same chapter, verses 9 through 11, we recognize that there are people from all over the world. Remember, there were, there were people from here and here and here. All those countries are listed. How do we each hear the, them speaking on our own native tongue? So there are people from all over the world who have come together here and they've been shaped into a new community. Now, as readers of the book of Acts, we're already privy to what God's plan is. Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus gave the commission to his apostles, it was to begin in Jerusalem, to move out through the province of Judea, then to travel up into Samaria, and then into the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus is saying, this gospel that you're preaching and this new community that will come together because of it, will make up people from every, every nation on the face of the earth, every tribe, every tongue, and they will now become part of this new community. Even Peter in his sermon, though I think, I think we'd have to say Peter did not fully understand the implications of the words he spoke. But in Acts 2.39, when Peter says, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, that is a... A, a very direct reference to the Gentile world. In Peter's sermon, speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, he says something that I believe he probably doesn't fully understand for 10 years, until Acts chapter 10, when he has a vision from God about eating unclean food and going to the house of a Gentile. It's not until Acts chapter 10 in Cornelius that Peter gets it, I think Peter probably in Acts 2.39 thought the Gentiles would come in through Israel and through faith in, in, the, in Moses and so forth. It'll take 10 years before he really understands the full implication. This is just my view of his words. And it's my view because in Acts 10, he's not even going to go to a Gentile's house, let alone preach to him. And so I think Peter, Peter goes through a, a, sort of another conversion of understanding <clears throat> a few years later. But it's there. It's there in the mind of God. Uh, from the very beginning. And, and this new community is now possible through forgiveness and through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we have a little bit of a clue in that very, <clears throat> excuse me, that very first verse, what it is that makes them a community. Now, this isn't a full list, but here's the verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayers. I think there's a sense in which this verse highlights the core, uh, and, and as I say, not, not everything, but it, 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 it shows the core of what immediately makes this a new group of people that's never been before. Because there are a lot of Jews in Jerusalem who've heard Peter preach who aren't part of this community because they're not a part of what's going on in this community. How would, how would you define each of these terms and how do each of them become a way that unites people into a new group? Starting out with the apostles' teaching. 
put, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking here generally. I mean, I'm not, I'm not meaning for us to lay out everything. You, but how does this, how does the fact, what does it mean to be devoted to the apostles' teaching? And how would having people doing that bring about unity? That, yeah. Alan? Excuse me, it's like today, where the apostles' <coughs> teaching is the Bible, the New Testament. Uh, and we are all gathered here because we're learning the New Testament. We know it's true. We know it ultimately comes from God. And I don't know if I'm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, this we're not. This is just a pretty. I mean, it's in a sense, it's a simple idea, isn't it? It's like they were devoted to hear. I mean, for them. Contextually, it's like they go to the temple every day to hear the apostles preach. And they're devoted to that because they need to hear that message because that's the message that's that's the message that they're going to be now living by. That's that's the teaching of the Christ. And by being devoted to that teaching, that's what's going to bring them together as a community. A Robin and then Mike. Sorry. Well, they, they teach Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part of being devoted to the apostles' teaching is recognizing that this is a different teaching that's coming from the temple and from the leaders of Israel, and which results, as Robin says, in persecution of these folks pretty quickly. But but they're devoted to a teaching that is different in nature. And this is, I mean, we we go back that we recognize what a game changer this is for a Jew to come to believe this. I mean, they've been they've attached their relationship with God for 1400 years to Moses and the law. And now in, in, in this moment of time, they're being told, yes, but all of that has now been fulfilled in the prophet like Moses. And it's through his sacrifice on the cross, the son of God, the son of David, that we can be forgiven, you know, once for all for, and, and they enter into this completely different experience than their Jewish brothers have entered into. So, uh, yeah, it's a different teaching. Mike? Well, it's what Robin said. It's being, they're set apart, and it's consistent. They're hearing the same message. Yes, exactly, yes. Yeah, they're hearing the same message, and it is a message uh, that sets them apart. Um, what about <coughs> fellowship? That's a really broad word, but what comes to your mind? I mean... I'll say potluck. It's not that's not the right answer. Although they do, and it's no small thing because it's mentioned later. They do share meals from house to house. They have they have potlucks for their large or small scale. I don't know if the five thousand or whatever ever get together, but they do eat together. That is part of fellowship. But specifically here, what does that bring to your mind that they're devoted to fellowship? Yes. They're devoted to the community, to the group, to what ties them together. And this is what flies in the face of, of what probably in the last generation has been taught so much. And we, we talked about this weeks ago, that so often salvation is tied to, well, I now have a personal relationship with Jesus and my sins are forgiven. Okay, that's fantastic. You, having the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ is essential. But the gospel forms a community. It forms a fellowship. There's none of this Jesus, yes, church, no. That, that's, that is so. Do you see how just that thought completely goes against God's eternal purpose to create a new community that undoes the, the fall of the, 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 the problem of the curse and the dysfunction of the human race? It's about reconciling everyone and everything together. Not just me. Not just, well, hey, I'm going to heaven. I, hey, that's, that is pretty much an ever more importance. Okay, I'll grant. But, but it's part of something that's so much bigger than just me. And that's why I was saying today when I was talking about our brothers and sisters who are visiting here. And we get back together and we recognize uh, the life experiences that we have and the things that tie us together and the way that we've shared life together, what God has done in bringing it. But we've got to be devoted to that fellowship. 
that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen by just going to a church. It happens by being devoted to the fellowship. And, and, and so it's a, it's a personal, individual determination that my life is cast with these folks and we're a family and we're in this together. And of course you have, you have a local in a sense fellowship at, at hand, but we have such a larger fellowship uh, that is global and that, that passes through the centuries. And they're devoted to that. But to breaking of bread, breaking of bread can mean a couple of things in the New Testament. What are the two things that it can mean? Yes, it can mean it can mean meals together or the communion of the Lord's Supper or, or the body and blood of Christ. And typically, uh, because it's the same word, the same wording, uh, typically the context is used to determine which is in, in mind. The breaking of bread is mentioned twice in this little passage from verse 42 to 47. Am I, this is okay. This is personal interpretation. In my reading of the text, the second, uh, the second use of this term is speaking about uh, meals together. They broke bread together from house to house daily. I think there. I think that's, in my view, that's most likely a reference to the fact that these people were all here at this point. They're all here in Jerusalem together. There are a lot of people coming into people's houses. There are a lot of people from the outside. They're eating together. They're sharing resources together. And it's kind of in a part of the passage that talks about that. Where here, I think, when we're thinking about the things that truly unite the community, the breaking of bread, the body and the blood of Christ, what more unites us than to partake of the body and the blood of Christ? To consume Christ as as our spiritual food and as the one who brings us together. And, and then, of course, for time reasons, just let me mention the fourth, prayer. And this is probably one that the 21st century church, at least in America, let, let me just say me, okay, and maybe you too, I don't know. I think this is one that we really need to be thinking about in terms of our fellowship being devoted to prayer devoted. These people are devoted to these things, and being devoted to prayer changes people. It changes, it changes a community. We're going, to, we're going to pick up from this point next week, and, and, our, and then we'll be looking at some, some messages out of the epistles that speak about from a, from a kind of a theological point of view, what's really happening in this community, what's God doing in this community, and where we're really headed if you want, like a, where we're headed in this lesson, and please read, is the second chapter of uh, of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter two, particularly verses eleven through twenty-two, and then the first part of Ephesians chapter three, because what we're going to see when we get to Ephesians, all of this is going to kind of build up to this point, that the coming together of this community does go back directly to what's happened at creation and what God longs to do because of what went wrong at the fall. Uh, and, and Ephesians is a place that brings so much of this together. Thank you for your, your, your participation, your just thinking together today and studying. And next week we'll move into these passages in the epistles that, will, that really get us into describing the kind of fellowship we have and the nature of that fellowship. Thanks so much.